Assalamu alaikum and good day, everyone. My name is Kulsum Khayas, and on behalf of the organizing committee of Aal Khan University's Six Sense Forum, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today. The Six Sense Forum organizes lectures and events because of the firm belief that free, open, and diverse academic discourse is the cornerstone of a great institution. To date, uh, since 2009, we have organized almost 60 sessions on topics as diverse as astronomy, art, political science, poetry, music, and literature by speakers within AKU and beyond Pakistan, as you perhaps saw on the, uh, on the screen while waiting for the session to start. We have also had sessions under the Apna Karachi and Apna Pakistan banner, which attempt to bring the discussion out of the ivory tower and focus on the country, its abundant problems, and importantly, some solutions. We've moved to an online format during the current circumstances, and I'm very grateful for the support of our IT colleagues and others in public affairs and members of the 6SF organizing committee for making it all happen. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to bring your attention to the chat feature of this webinar. For the question and answers at the end of the talk, please post your questions in the chat bar here. It is now my pleasure to invite today's speaker, Tariq Alexander Kesar. Tariq is the principal architect at his Karachi-based firm, TAQ Associates, Architecture and Interior Design. The studio's work encompasses a spectrum of project types, hospitals to schools, office buildings to apartments, residences to shops and restaurants, along with mobile libraries and boats. Tariq is a student and lover of nature and is an active conservationist. He's a photographer, a videographer, and a film editor. He paints, writes poetry and prose. He is the author of two books, Baltistan, Apricot Bloom, and Samandar Par. Both books are a compilation of poetry, photographs, and essays. Truly a Renaissance man. Currently, he's working on a four-volume book and documentary on the ecology of the mangroves of Karachi, titled The Edge of Delta. Tariq uh, also teaches architectural design. He's been associated with the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture here in Karachi, and has also been a faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health in Boston from 2008 to 2016 for their summer course titled Building Design and Engineering Approaches to Airborne Infection Control. Tariq has a deep interest in science, art, and craft, and I have no doubt it will be a pleasure to hear from him today. Before I invite Tariq to take the virtual stage, however, I'd like to request Samir Sadruddin, a member of our organizing committee and director of design and engineering at AKU to say a few words. Samir, over to you. Thank you, Kulsum. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure uh, to be here, first of all, and uh, a pleasure to uh, introduce Tariq, who well, you already have, but uh, I would like to say a few words. I've known Tariq for a few years now and uh, he has taken me on some amazing trips into the edge of Delta. And I just want to read a short passage out from his brief, which really encapsulates what's happening. Uh, the way of life present here is unique. It has existed for thousands of years and most certainly needs to be recorded, preserved, and sustainably modernized. Animals that exist here are also incredible, both naturally evolved and the introduced fish that walk, camels that swim, crabs that climb trees, worms that are five feet long. And uh, one thing Tariq forgot to mention, which I must add is crows that sweep down <laughs> into the water and fish like seagulls. Uh, the beauty of this environment is that even the boats that fly these waters have their own evolutionary stories. There's been long uh, sustainable relationship of man and nature here. Um, for those of you who have never ventured out into this delta or anywhere around the mangroves, you know, I believe that it is a life-changing experience. You are one with nature. It is unbelievably quiet, except for the occasional helicopter that ho hovers around. And, and the plant life and the incredible marine life and the animals and the birds are a breathtakingly beautiful and super relaxing experience. These have been my moments of extreme joy and I have Tariq to thank. So Tariq, I'm going to hand this over to you from here. Let me unmute myself. Uh, can uh, you all see me? 
we can, Tarek. Thanks. Okay, lovely. Thank you so very much for uh, inviting me to be part of this incredible series. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor. And uh, for me personally, it's a very important uh, moment. Uh, I have been very passionate about nature and about this environment, in fact, all natural environments. Uh, and uh, they have an incredibly important part to play in not just my life, but in all of our lives. The reason I started going into these mangroves uh, is many, but it started in the early 2000s when uh, the fish stock was decimated and uh, my fishing career, so to speak, uh, ended. It was heartbreaking to see months very profuse and uh, well-stocked uh, seas empty out within a period of one year. This was when foreign uh, fishing trawlers were given permission to ply our waters and they not only cleaned our uh, uh, life in the water, but they also decimated the reefs. So I, my concentration uh, turn towards this distant line on the horizon, which is a little green line of uh, trees and mangroves. I've never been in there. It was 2000s, I've been on the ocean maybe 15 years before that. And I started venturing in and it was one of the most, as Samir said, life altering experiences. I am going to get rid of my face for now and I will share my screen to show you something extremely special. I call this tree the tree no more because it isn't. And I first met it, I think it's a him, uh, in 2011. I first photographed it in 2012. And my last photograph of it was in 2016. It had been cut. I couldn't go back into the mangroves for at least six months and started again, thankfully. But the emotions are such that I tend to lose words, which is rather difficult for me. But why do I do this? Why do I take photographs? Why do I uh, go into uh, these mangroves? It started off by just purely going in for the pleasure of it to make a record and just to take nice pictures, keep them, enjoy myself, be one with nature. And then I realized that it has to be more than that. And I started uh, compiling it into uh, a series of books and a documentary. And recently, a few years ago, I uh, had a profound moment where I realized that we were in this incredible position in time that our actions could possibly make a difference in uh, the environment and the world that we live in. Uh, that these ecosystems and these uh, forests need, need to be saved. Uh, saved for posterity, for our children, and for the future generations and for the future of uh, Karachi and the future of uh, a healthy environment in Karachi. I'd like to read a little bit as we proceed uh, as just now. Uh, it is a joy to experience these ecosystems and see symbiotic relationships that exist within them. There are constant manifestations of physical change and evolution here. Incredible adaptations to life are visible in environments that are so, so very different to our own. It is the exceptional to see trees growing in salt water and see roots that breathe at low tide, roots that reach upwards of the ground. It is strange to ride on rising waters, touch salt crusted leaves and sense flowers and canopies of those very same trees. And the word is sense before see. It is magnificent, absolutely magnificent when migratory birds come and call this their home. 
It is astounding to see ancient fish that skip on mud and the buried five foot long worms. It has been wonderful seeing camels milked and watered and talk to the men that come to eat the living off these islands. And in 15 years, one lady. I find it very difficult. I find it very difficult seeing and recording this. It has been joyful, but also extremely painful. We are constantly accelerating negative change in ecosystems and environments that we inhabit and love, yet ignore and abuse. Here too are stories of decay. These need to be told. These need to be documented and discussed. Stories of decay don't have happy endings. Their endings are in silence. Their endings are in silence and rot. Here too are stories of decay. These need to be told. We hold on to residual reminiscences and tell tales about what we have seen, but forget that memories do dissipate into imaginings. There are wonderful stories here in these mangroves. So many of them are simply pure joy. There are some that might remain. To tell them is necessary. To tell them is very necessary because as of yet, all is not lost. That's something I very sincerely believe that all is not lost. When we enter the mangroves, we reach its periphery on a larger boat, climb into a smaller boat with a shallow draft, and we enter tunnels that are narrow, winding, and end in cul-de-sacs that have this cacophony of bird sound, which is different every time we're in there. The sounds that you're hearing in the background are act the actual sounds recorded within this. The mangroves and bundle island, and these are the ones that you're seeing right now, are incredibly dense. And uh, this is a video from 2019, and uh, incidentally, one of the trips that uh, Samir had joined us on. And you turn and you twist and you enter these incredible passages where you have to push aside and lift over apart the leaves so that another wider channel comes, opens up in front of you. And environments, this is Samir's hand, incidentally. So probably one of the most sumptuous moments that I've had was discovering these flowers. As I said before, you don't see them first, you sense them. They're tiny, the bud is not larger than the nail of your small finger. And the scent permeates the mangroves in the evenings. The nectar produces the most incredibly beautiful honey. So in spring, nowadays, you will see the olive green of the mangroves turn into a hue of gold. And it's this little flower, not thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, that change the cast of this entire ecosystem into this golden hue. The flower grows into a seed that's about an inch long eventually. It matures on the tree, sprouts its roots, falls in the water, sheds its outer skin, splits open, starts sprouting roots. Sometimes it does this while it's still on the tree, but most often it falls in the water. It'll float average about five miles from its mother tree. And if it's lucky, it hits the right kind of soil and the roots take hold and a little mangrove plant grows. And if we are lucky, this is what we get. And the mangrove, the Avacina marina, which is this species that we are showing, will grow into a tree of that scale.
exiting the mangroves is always has to be planned and timed because if you stay in there too late and the tide flows out you do get stuck we have we have at times and you get out you walk the mangroves there are 14 different species of spit snakes in here apparently i haven't seen them but i have read about them and i've been told about them uh, and there are spiders insects wasps that are inch inch and a half long and it's, it's one of the most incredible, vibrant ecosystems that is resilient, that has uh, adapted itself to live with the abuse that we give it. There's another little uh, reading that I would like to, to do, just a short paragraph. Uh, there is incredible stillness here, even amongst the cacophony of birdsong. There are times that I have lost orientation within these spaces, not just meandering within the channel, but also when stationary. There have been times that I have felt vertigo even when motionless while on the surface of these very quiet and reflective waters. Do branches reach downwards or upwards? Which side is the sky and where is water? Where is up and where is down? Often I can't find the threshold, the line where the up and the down meet. So often the mirrored and the real merge here. These islands are uninhabited. People don't live here, but they come to here to work. There's fishing. Oh, excuse me, I apologize. So people come here to work. Obviously, there's fishing. All kinds and all sizes. This is one of the very, very sad, harsh realities that we have created. Fingerlings, not more than an inch, inch and a half long, caught and processed into chicken feed. People come here to work. They tend their nets, as that young man was, they come on their little kayaks, uh, paddle with their plates, they come to crab. The chicken that is produced from the fish meal, their claws are cut, the claws are used to catch the crabs. Men walk the waters, pushing these barrels. This is probably one of my most enchanting encounters. This boy was an incredible, incredible young man. Then there are the camels and the camel feathers. Haji Ismail, this gentleman. So they bring the camels to the islands, they swim them across, and every day they bring a boatload of water, sweet water. The camels are called, this is the sound. This gentleman is someone I know personally now over the years. And there's a relationship between these animals and men. And the empathy and the joy in their lives is, is actually uh, very present, including the poverty and the pain. Another incredibly enchanting encounter. So we were within the channels and just happened upon this little uh, group of camels. They'd... Walking on water. As the tides recede and the sandbanks uh, start becoming visible, these gentlemen come out to collect these razor clams or mussels. And they walk, feel for them with their toes, pull them out. They also dive for them. So they'll bring, bring out big clusters of these uh, shellfish put them in the boats, scrub them, clean them, and uh, get sold. I don't know if I would eat them.
these men are looking for <coughs> bloodworms. Bloodworms are used for bait to catch fish on line. And the bloodworms will grow to a length of five feet. They burrow horizontally and in the oxygen deprived soil, they create tunnels that crisscross the entire mangrove system. And these animals create burrows that are vertical. So you have here an environment that is completely devoid of oxygen underneath. But it has air channels that run horizontally and vertically all the crisscross it underneath. And as the tides recede, the oxygenated water is taken right down into them and the, line, the walls of all these tunnels get lined with uh, life baby giving oxygen, which then gets inhabited by these animals. So the ecosystem out here and the microbial uh, life in there must be absolutely incredible. So these are, these are our muskippers. And then of course, there are the birds. We used to have a resident, a number of resident flocks of flamingos and the migratory ones. This year, 2020, there are no flamingos. There are no flamingos. They did not return and the residents have disappeared. However, the wetlands in Sharjah and in uh, Abu Dhabi have had a large influx of flamingos. I don't know. Crows hunt as eagles, as Samir had pointed out. And if I were to say which one was a dominant uh, bird in this uh, environment, it's not this. Well, it's not this eagle. This is a Brahmani kite. It is the crow. I have seen crows attacking the eagles after the eagles have caught their fish and snatching it away. 2016, I was privileged to see the marine bioluminescence on the creeks. I've seen them previously, many, many years ago, many times out in the open water. I've written, written about them. And, uh, but in 2016, I was able to take these photographs. And in 2020, this year, I was able to complete another series. So I hope you enjoy this. This is extremely special. The videos are taken just off the DHA golf club between Bundle Island and Dodaria, near the Kolachi area and the golf club. So it's, it's right on our shores. And it's something that very few of us have been privileged to see because there's much too much light that's uh, on them. And,
What, what is marine bioluminescence? Uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton. They have two chemicals in them. It's called luciferinase and lucifer. And when uh, they get agitated, the chemicals mix and create the glow. The chemicals separate and it can be repeated after a little while. It's a defensive mechanism to highlight the presence of uh, the plankton so that the fish that are coming to eat it get a, get a little fearful because they become visible to the larger predators nearby. Very simple evolutionary process, very complicated in its execution and it's uh, prevalent. Uh, Pakistan's waters are one of the marine hotspots, one of the world's hotspots for marine bioluminescence. And uh, it's an incredible fact. And it's a fact that needs uh, to be highlighted and showcased. It needs during the season, which is generally uh, in fall and winter from about uh, October to January, February, depending on the winds that the bioluminescence comes right to our shores. And uh, it's truly magical. The images that you've seen there are not enhanced and the videos are in actuality as to what your eye will perceive. However, when there is light as it was on the Dodaria scene where the fish jumped, the marine bioluminescence is not visible. The light takes over. So it has to be a dark night and the moonless night. This section, I would like to uh, talk a little about our city and its relationship to our delta and our mangroves and uh, specifically the islands and the developments that uh, might be happening. So our delta is expansive, and we know it's, it's uh, the largest arid mangrove uh, delta in the world. Uh, I photographed this in Katie Mandar in 2017. As you head to eastwards towards the Ran of Kutch, the water becomes saltier because there's less sweet water coming down the Indus, and it results in this uh, plantation dies. However, even though this is an extremely arid area, the plantation here is, uh, the new plantation of mangroves has been incredible. I mean, the forestry department and the NGOs have been doing incredible work. Uh, they've been setting records. But the fact is there's very little sweet water and there's a lot of pollution and a lot of garbage. Our cities and our waterways are uh, downstream of uh, industry, commerce, uh, buildings, our lives pollute the waters with sewage. None of it gets treated, hardly any of it, in fact, none. And uh, the island of Kapniawala and Bundle Island are extremely important because the mangroves on Bundle Island are huge. This was photographed in 2009, no, 2020 early, February, I think. And uh, this is the North Shore of uh, Bundle Island, which I'd like to put down on record with the trees. And uh, there is life here. It's profuse and it's very vibrant. Uh, the birds had come, were coming till to uh, the early 2020s. This year, the birds have not come because the, the beautiful, pristine forests still are, but the sound that you hear is overshadowed by the sound of accents. And they echo through these trees and uh, the decimation is incredible. The pace has increased this year and it needs to stop. It needs to be acknowledged that these are very valuable forests and need, need their protection. This is the tree. And this is the photograph in 2016. 
Mind you, we haven't lost them as yet. The cutting has been going on for a very long time. It had slowed down in between. Uh, 2019, the focus of the cutting was on Kipriyawala, which is the island adjacent. This wood is not usable for furniture or construction. It is a hardwood. It's got a resin in it. So it's used to make coal. It's burnt. Look at all this chopping up. The cutting is very systematic. It, ha it occurs in pockets and uh, it will not be contiguous. They will take a pocket of it. Chainsaws will be brought in. The trunks will be cut. The trees will be left to lie in the water, dry. And then carted away. But not all is lost. This is still here. We still have this. And it really, really needs to be kept. And Karachi needs and deserves an ecosystem and an environment that cleans the air that provides a deep that provides a carbon sink and will allow us to carry in to the future with health and uh, some semblance of uh, quality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tariq. That was absolutely lovely. And um, you have managed to capture all of the sort of the, the essence of the space in your images and the sounds and uh, truly beautiful. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go into the uh, questions. There are a few questions coming in right now and there are a few questions related around the decimation of the forest. Is this decimation happening for the use of the locals primarily 
or is it a very concerted effort to clear the island for uh, development? Uh, I don't have that answer. I just know what I have observed. The uh, cutting escalated on Kipriyawala, the adjacent island, in uh, 2018. And uh, there were plans for development there for terminals and uh, to be developed on the islands. Uh, so the, the, the volume of cutting suddenly seemed to increase. Uh, has the cutting been happening? Yes, it's been happening over, over the centuries. There's been a, there has been a exploitative at times very much of a symbiotic relationship, even if I may say that. Uh, between man and the mangrove tree because the branches have always been used and harvested for firewood and heating. So the locals have been using it for centuries and it's not impacted the uh, mangrove forests an incredible amount. However, population growth is there and our urban sprawl is there. If you, if you look at uh, uh, aerial photographs, uh, which I'm not allowed to take, but I've seen, that others have taken, uh, the urban sprawl creek and the most luscious uh, mangroves in the Port Qasim area and the uh, Landi area, Kurangi area. So yes, uh, locals have been cutting it and they have the right to harvest it. They've been doing it sustainably over many centuries. What has happened currently is that the cutting is not sustainable. Uh, Bundle Island, on the other hand, uh, I had not seen massive, witnessed massive cutting. The cuts that even that you had seen were old cuts, which already had uh, shrubs and branches growing out of, out of the stumps. Uh, the cutting on Bundle Island had occurred many years ago, but for a long, for a while, uh, it, had, it seemed to have stopped. And this year, the COVID time, and specifically, uh, right, the recent uh, winter, period, the entire forest resounds with the sound of ax hits. Now, uh, whether the locals have just taken upon themselves to suddenly increase this, but large trunks, so foot in diameter, 18 inches in diameter have, have been cut by chainsaws. So I don't know. I think the I think the authorities and the forest department needs to take uh, take notice of this. Uh, we have uh, uh, I've been posting these uh, images and the videos, and they've been going to the relevant people. But uh, I don't know. So I do not if, know the answer to that. If but we it's conjecture. Were to become, and it's, yeah, if we were to become really optimistic and think that the government would enforce. Uh, all kinds of restrictions on the chopping down of this wood and uh, recreating the forest. What would the locals use as a source of- You've fuel? got to give an alternative. You have to give an, al you have to give an alternative source right. of fuel. Right. The, the thing is the locals should still have the right to sustainably cut the way they used to. Because if you, if you cut the lower branches of an Avacina marina, it grows to great heights. And it, and, it, and it thrives. Even the camels, when they, when they feed off the lower branches, they don't kill the tree. They kill the tree when it's a seedling and they step on it. Uh, so, so it's doable for them to continue the cutting. But what has to stop immediately is the cutting of the trees for industrial use. There have been industries that are using this to fire, fire uh, furnaces. Uh, and the wood is being sold on that. Mm -hmm. So the sale of the wood in the market needs to slow down, needs to be stopped. Uh, you'll see this going to the beach. You see Gadagadi loads, Suzuki loads of mangrove wood being brought out there. The sale needs to stop. How do you stop that? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, the cutting, uh, the villagers need to be able to harvest the wood to uh, to a certain degree, but it can be monitored, it should be monitored, and it should be organized and uh, sustainably done. So what you do is, I was talking to one of the NGOs who, who runs these programs, and they've been doing incredible work. 
uh, the NGOs working on IUCN, WWF, the Forest Department, and a lot of private uh, philanthropists have been doing incredible work on the mangroves. But the fact is that they are planting in uh, areas which are devoid of brackish water, it's pure saline water. Now, the Avicenna marina will flourish to a certain degree, but its growth rate is going to be much smaller. The extreme west of the delta or Karachi's east, which is the Dodaria area and the Bardal Island and Kipriyawala and the, the closer islands, Port Qasim areas, they, are, they get the flush, clean water of the ocean, which then mixes with this really contaminated, polluted water of our sewage that we threw in there. But what it's done, it's created this uh, the system of, uh, of the right uh, salt content in the water, the right pH in the water that uh, has allowed these forests to flourish. So even if we were to lose, say maybe these are hypothetical, uh, non-evidence-based non numbers, but say we even were to lose 25, 30% of the dense forests that you've seen. Uh, within a 15 year period, we can regrow this. Okay. Uh, Bundle Island itself and Capriyawala. Capriyawala is substantially mostly covered uh, by forest, but Bundle Island is very largely open. A lot of the areas are intertidal. They are below the water level. And if we were to plant mangroves within the lower channels, which permeate all over this uh, island, uh, you can probably cover 60% of this island in mangroves. Right now, it's 10%. 10% of the land of Bundle Island is mangrove. So if Bundle Island became a nature reserve, you have, you have beaches for turtles. They already nest there, the seaward side. You have all kinds of crabs and shellfish and shells that live there. You've seen the worms. You've seen, uh, you haven't shown you all the other beetles and insects that are intertidal that live in this thing that actually aerate the ground. Uh, the variety of plants there is just astounding. They're beautiful. You've got scrubland, you've got scrub, scrub, scrub plants, you've got uh, the mangroves, you've got the intertidal plants, you've got those little crests on top of the little sand hillocks which uh, survive without getting inundated. So this is an island that even in the future when uh, sea level rises and a substantial part of the island goes even further, at least a foot to a foot and a half underwater in the next 30 to 50 years. Uh, the topography of this island, I very strongly believe, is such that uh, we can uh, create a very, very vibrant, large 20 odd kilometers, 24 kilometers right now, square uh, of mangrove. Karachi needs a space like this that produces oxygen and takes out the carbon and absorbs it. If Karachi and we all who live here need to live with a certain quality of life and a breathability of life, then these areas are the very ones because they're upwind from us that provide this life-giving oxygen to all of uh, Landi, Kurangi, uh, DHA, depending on the wind, wind direction. So, so Karachi needs this. Right. And uh, it's an opportunity. I feel, I feel so strongly that we have an opportunity to create something where there is a will also within the establishment, within the government, to create a green environment, to create an environment that is ecologically positive and uh, future friendly. Uh, it's an opportunity. It needs to be grabbed. It needs to be grabbed. Is there, is there any legislation for this? I don't. Uh, uh, this is a Ramsar site. Ramsar is a very weak, uh, weak agreement of wetlands. Uh, because it's up to the it's up to the uh, country itself to decide on how to, how they want to establish it. So on one level, these forests are all uh, designated as protected forests, 
but on the land revenue departments, they are designated as wastelands. Mm. So, so there's some uh, there's some ambiguity. In... There's a lot of ambiguity, and and the thing is, it's uh, you know you can't you can't and you shouldn't stop development. Development is extremely important for for the beneficial growth of human uh, and humanity, and for our societies and economies, but it has to be equitable and it has to be equitable, not just to uh, a certain segment mm -hmm. of people, but it has to be equitable, not just to people, it has to be equitable to uh, life and creation. Mm -hmm. Because if we have to survive the next few centuries, let us just talk about Karachi, we have to survive in harmony and in synergy with nature. The forces of nature are way more powerful than what we can ever produce. Right. So that's important, and I think this is the time. This is the time to do it. I don't know if you've been reading the on the chat all of the accolades and all of the appreciation. Yeah, I have not. I have not. I have been. I have been. I have been <laughs> concentrating on not not About saying something. How and impressive I'd... and beautiful it is, but I have to mention this one person mentioning that hidden forest exposed by hidden hero. Really impressive. So that's for you. Um, I'll move on to ask you another question. Uh, flamingos in Sharjah. I know Pakistanis love to go to the UAE. Uh, why are the flamingos going there? And uh, has uh, COVID last year, you mentioned last year they didn't come. Has COVID had an impact on that? It should only have been better for the environment, no? You know, I've been going into these forests now for 15 years plus, I, I, I lose track of the number of years, but uh, I've been going in there and uh, going in with different objectives and uh, until uh, uh, a year or so ago, I was a little worried about interacting too much with uh, certain kinds of people, uh, the poachers, the bird poachers, all kinds of things, the woodcutters. Uh, the gentleman whose voice you heard, I have seen him as a cook. He's a camel caller also. He's got the most incredible camel calling voice. Uh, you didn't see his face. I didn't show it because mm -hmm. I was going to mention this. I have seen him as a cook with the camel herders. He offers me a meal almost every time I meet him. I've mm -hmm. seen him with the crabbers as a cook and I've seen him as a lookout man and a cook for the woodcutters. Okay. Uh, now these are these are people whose whose lives are tied very integrally with with this forest. And over the years I've gotten to know them personally. They recognize me uh, and I respect them a lot. And my last interaction with the flamingos was on the day when I actually learned how they catch falcons, how they poach falcons. I was trying to figure out and learn how, how that is done. Uh, we happened upon them and we talked to them. Uh, there was another hide that I didn't approach, which was a hide for uh, the, uh, the flamingo catchers. It's a very cruel way that they catch them. They put out a they put out a line with a with a with a lure with hooks on it, and a dead fish. And so the flamingo sweeps it out and puts it in its mouth. And the hooks get caught in its throat. It tries to fly away, and then they pull it down. Unfortunately, uh, there is a myth that says that flamingo meat is an aphrodisiac, so okay. it has a market. Okay. And uh, you know, so 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 these people were catching flamingos uh, sporadically. But after that interaction, the flamingos disappeared. It's not because of them. So something more than this has happened because they've been doing this for centuries also. Uh, why did the flamingos disappear? My theory is that the, the cutting of the forest has escalated. So the, the entire area is disturbed. Uh, I, the day that I, I, I couldn't even film properly that day. I couldn't, I was so disturbed. So normally I have my sound recorder, my high fidelity sound recorder, and I put it up. You've seen it. I just just couldn't couldn't even do it because the entire forest was just resounding with access. Dum, 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 
And it wasn't happening in one place, it was happening in several places. And I have a feeling that what has happened is that this, this activity has probably scared the flamingos away. And the fact that there is a, a safe haven in both in Sharjah and Abu Dhabi in the wetlands, they're incredibly beautiful. And they've recently been uh, uh, promoting them. Uh, and these birds are actually senitent, they're not stupid. You know, yeah. it's, uh, you can see it the way they interact. I mean, they have, uh, they will, the, the flocks will have a crash where all the yearlings are kept together with under the supervision of two or three adults. And mm -hmm. even if every, everyone is sleeping, if you approach them within 150 yards or so, mm -hmm. one of them will raise its head like this and the next adult will go, babies will keep sleeping. And suddenly there's a slightly different tone and everyone gently lifts the legs up and walks away. <laughs> you know, and, and, and this happens when you have this flock of 600, 800 birds, you can only get to a certain distance because they've learned to be wary of us. Right. So, 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 so they communicate and you can, I, I, I've, I've seen the communication happening where one adult is telling the other and they are opposite ends of the crash. And then they make another slightly different sound and the entire crash gets up and walks away. Mm -hmm. So these are yearlings, babies, and the adults are much more vocal. And even when the flocks are sleeping, the adult flocks, there's always one or two watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you get close and you see that adult lift its head and just, you know, slight change in the, in the, in the eye direction. Right. And you get to a certain point and they all move away. You get too close, they all fly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the photograph that I had in this was done at that point where I actually got made sure I got there to fly. So we had all the cameras set up and then they took off. That's oh, just the most beautiful thing. I have a few hundred pictures of that uh, time, and, uh, <laughs> but that's gone. They're not here. They're not here. Yeah. So I don't know why they're there, but my hypothesis is that, that, yeah, the noise, the cutting, the poaching, they just fed up. So we not only lost out on uh, uh, the international flights coming into our airports, and sent it off to the We've sent our flamingos there. Right. And that's a crime. That's a crime. And the thing is, you can bring them back. But we have to. We have to create reserves where they feel safe, where they feel protected. It's good for the country. It's good for ecotourism. It's great for ecotourism. And yeah. we already have it. We have one of the most incredible destinations up north in the mountains and the most incredible destinations on our delta. We just have to look after it. All right. Agreed 100%. Tariq, we're almost running out of time. I just want to reiterate all the congratulations and the appreciations that have come in. We will share them all with you. There are many, many more questions, which unfortunately we may not be able to uh, take up right now. Uh, what is an important thing though, and perhaps you could spend a couple of minutes on this with us, is that there are many people asking about volunteering. There are many people asking about liaisons with uh, world, uh, a wildlife Federation and other agencies. Uh, they want to know um, if there are any such uh, liaisons going on, if there's any work being done, how can they volunteer to participate in this and how can we go visit if there are any tours, if there is any opportunity for people to get on a boat and get out there and enjoy this beauty. Uh, It's, I don't run an organization. I run a group of friends that I call TAQ and crew. You are one of them. Uh, and we go periodically in there. I have uh, a couple of very regular friends who are uh, cameramen. So I take care of the video. My friend, very dear friend, Temur Mirza, uh, handles the still cameras. I hope you're here, Temur. So highly appreciated there. There's a number of other photographers who, who joined me on, on separate trips. Uh, but it's a, it's a very small personalized group because we go in, in small groups. It's not, uh, it's not organized. It's actually uh, risky. We get stuck in there. You've been, st you've been stung by that insect and bled like crazy. <laughs> and we didn't have the first aid kit on the boat that day, you know. So, so, so taking tours in does have risks. It's not entirely safe, uh, and it's certainly not monitored by anything. So, 
uh, until the government decides that tours need to be organized, I don't think one can organize tours on this thing. Uh, I, I am also uh, selective when, when I go in there, tide dependent and environment dependent and activity in, within the mangroves dependent. Uh, but for, uh, as a closing remark, what I'd really like to emphasize and talk about Samir, okay, and that should answer some of the questions is, uh, I've said this before, and I so firmly believe this, that I find myself and all of us to be in this incredible position. It's a unique position that doesn't happen very often in one's life. And it's certainly the first time that has happened in my life. I'm touching 60 now. Uh, that we have a chance and an opportunity to do something where our actions might actually have an impact for change, for betterment. Uh, so yes, so people who want to do something about it can and should. And the thing is that it has to be a huge volume of people, uh, a critical mass of people that say we want and we need this and we do. And they need to be saved. And the key thing that needs to be done is that nature reserves need to be created, wildlife reserves and carbon sinks need to be created all around Karachi. Uh, how does one do that? One does that by demanding, by asking, by advocacy. There cannot be only one organization or a few organizations that are doing this. There are many organizations. I mean, I, I have to commend the work that IUCN and WWF are doing. I mean, just the, the, the efforts are incredible. And uh, let there be no doubt about it. Let there be no doubt about the fact that there are incredibly well-meaning, good people doing a lot of work for the mangroves. A lot of agencies, a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations, a lot of individuals, a lot of farm owners, landowners, uh, windmill owners, wind turbine owners, they're, they're, they're doing incredible work. I've witnessed it. I've been taken to some of them. I've seen them. And uh, I... Uh, have to have you have to commend them you have to praise them to to the utmost levels but it cannot be done by only a few organizations and a few groups and individuals there has to be more so and if someone is genuine and interested in doing something about it create your advocacy group do your research put out the demand talk to the people we all know people all of us know people who have the possibility of, of implementing a change. Yeah, so if enough, great. if there's enough demand, it will happen. Right. And we are in a position to do this. Please have no doubt that we have an opportunity. So I'd like to end with that. Tariq, your presentation was mesmerizing. And uh, we have all been moved. I, you can certainly tell the audience has been really moved. There's incredible appreciation for this. We thank you. We thank you very much. We thank you for all the work you're doing. And uh, you are the glimmer of hope uh, for Karachi, people like you. And inshallah, we will gather more uh, advocacy, uh, you know, as the awareness rises. And thank you for making us all aware thank by you. sending out your weekly posts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Tariq. Thank Let you me just add that, my yes. thanks. We'll certainly share all the questions with you and all the comments. Uh, I think you'll be pleased to read them and maybe you might consider answering some of them. And thank you to our audience for attending.